The events I am about to tell you took place during the Second Scottish War for Independence in 1338 of Christ era, in Dunbar Castle in East Lothian, in Scotland. I am Agnes Randolph, Countess of Dunbar, known as Black Agnes, perhaps for my dark complexion, and this is my story. And this is Patrick, 9th Earl of Dunbar, my husband. When he is not busy with his military activities, he loves to go hunting, spending half of the day in the forest, especially now, when I am furious with him, and he is looking for a chance to escape my anger. He is well aware of his military strategies, while effective at war, being completely useless at the family battlefield. In fact, I have a serious reason to be angry with my lord, but before I take you to the root of our family argument, let me tell you, how I became the Countess of Dunbar. I was born to Sir Thomas Randolph, Earl of Murray, who played a key role in Scottish Wars for Independence. He was a nephew and a close confidant of King Robert the Bruce. Father was a commander in the Battle of Stanhope Park against the English, where they suffered a defeat and were forced to sign a treaty, by which Scotland's independence was finally acknowledged. As one of the poets said of him, Loyalty he loved above all things. Falsehood, treason, and felony. He stood against always earnestly. He exalted honor and liberality. And always strove for righteousness. I was grieving when my father suddenly passed away, and I believe, I possessed his sense of justice and love for our land. As it was a custom in those days, my sister and I were given into arranged marriages, thus I became a Countess of Dunbar at the age of 12. As you can assume, love was not a part of the arrangement. Especially, taking into account, that Patrick was 27 years senior to me. But women were raised to take a marriage as a duty, and so I did. However, things started somewhat changing, when I had grown from a girl into a young woman. Patrick began noticing my beauty, which made our marriage more enjoyable. He also came to appreciate my industriousness and independence, which came in handy, when my Robin Hood was away, fighting for our country, since he realized, he could entrust me with taking charge of our household, castle and manor. No sooner things had started looking smooth, than I got the shocking news, that Patrick had aligned himself with the English for a while. To say I was frustrated upon hearing that, is not to say anything. I felt betrayed, stabbed in my back, I was infuriated. I just couldn't get it, how on earth could he break his vow of loyalty to our beloved Scotland? Our relationship significantly deteriorated upon his returning home. He tried to explain his decision with a huge pressure he had been experiencing and s real fear for his relatives' welfare, that it was just a strategical move to buy out some time to fortify our castle and be better prepared for the further battles. But I didn't want to listen. 
The image of my father, who had done so much for the independence of our country, was constantly in front of my eyes. And we fought, and fought, and fought, making our heated arguments go deep into the night. By wintertime he had made his position clear to the Scottish noblemen he was going to fight on their side and started preparing for the battle. It calmed me down a bit, and, even though I was still harboring some grudge, I decided to reconcile with the old chap. But now the English considered him to be a traitor, and we were well aware of the potential consequences, so we took some additional measures to fortify our castle, and made sure, we had enough provision for the winter. After having said our goodbyes, Patrick headed to the north to fight English troops there. We spent a quiet Christmas with my household at home, and we hoped our peace wouldn't be disrupted for the rest of the winter. However, the King of England had different plans. On the 13th of January 1338, the English, led by William Montague, 1st Earl of Salisbury, laid siege to our castle, where I was with my ladies-in-waiting, my maids, and a handful of cords. By contrast, the English army consisted of about 20,000 warriors. They had at their disposal mangonels, catapults capable of hurling large boulders, which had been brought in by sea. Additionally, the English hired Genos galleys, so that we would be cut off from the supply. And, besides, Montague was considered to be one of the best generals of the day. Needless to say, the Dunbar Castle seemed a piece of cake for the English, which was not going to take long to conquer. Montague demanded us to surrender. Little did he know who he was dealing with. Black Agnes, the daughter of Thomas Randolph, would defend her castle and her freedom at any cost, even to the point of death. In response to Montague's demand, I stood up on the wall and declared. Of Scotland's king I hoard my house, I pay him meat and fee, and I will keep my good old house, while my house will keep me. Salisbury fired back, catapulting huge rocks and lead shot against the ramparts. His goal was to scare us and slowly demolish the castle's defences. My response. I ordered my ladies-in-waiting to wear their best Sunday outfits, and we would go out onto the ramparts at the end of each day and, in full view of the English, dust down the damaged stonework with our white handkerchiefs. The English moved from their camp closer to the castle and set up their tents here, to intensify the attacks. So we would watch them every day sharpening their swords and exercising, as Scottish winter was a bit harsh for them. After a while, Montagu, tired of my daily raunting shows with handkerchiefs, came up with a plan to attack the main gate of the castle with a battering ram known as a so. It was a siege structure, similar to the one my Lord Patrick used, when hunting for deers, in a larger size, of course. By means of the sow our enemies planned to bypass the castle defences. The wooden roof was meant to protect them during the assault. While they were setting up the structure in front of the gate, I cried out. My lord, take good care of his sow, for she would soon cast her pigs within the fortress. Then I ordered to drop a huge boulder, fired during a previous attack on the castle, over the walls. Thus my prophecy came true, 
the English assault machine was smashed to pieces. Some of our enemies were hurt too. Yes, I did have only my ladies in waiting and a few guards on my side, but I was determined to do my best to make the English siege as difficult as possible. It goes without saying, my Lord Montagu was somewhat disappointed at the outcome of his brilliant strategy. As the siege went on, winter came into spring. Yet, my determination to protect my castle and my freedom was as strong as ever. At one point I spotted Montagu, riding around the castle with his second-in-command, so I instructed one of my archers to kill them both. Salisbury was missed by an arrow and quickly rode out of range, however, one arrow pierced straight into the chest of his second-in-command and immediately killed him. The Earl sarcastically commented. There comes one of my lady's tire pins, Agnes's love shafts go straight to the heart. Unable to make progress through arms, he decided to turn to craft. He bribed one of my men, who guarded the principal entrance, advising him to leave the gate unlocked, or to leave it in such a manner, that the English could easily break in. Alas, my lord. Not this time. The guy, though he took the Englishman's money, happened to be loyal to me, and reported the stratagem, so I'd set a trap and was ready for the English, when they made entry. Although Montagu was in the lead, one of his men pushed past him just at the moment when my men lowered the portcullis, separating him from the others. I, of course, had meant to take the Earl as a hostage, but I moved from stratagem to taunt, shouting at him. Farewell, Montagu, I intended that you should have supped with us, and assist us in defending the castle against the English. Having his ego hurt, the Earl decided to use his last, and the most painful weapon against me. My brother, John Randolph, who had been taken by the English as a prisoner, was brought to Dunbar, and Montague threatened to hang him, if I did not surrender the castle. It took me a tremendous amount of self-control to keep myself cool in front of them, but I had pledged not to give up, whatever the cause, so I merely responded. My lords, you can kill him. His death will only benefit me, since I am his heir. And his lands will be mine. Miraculously, they believed me, and John was released. As the siege had lasted for a few months, as well as the English, we started running low of provision. I realized, there was little hope, that somebody could come to our rescue. The thought of my loyal servants, who might die of starvation, was really heavy for my heart. All I could do, was just to pray to God, so that he would get us out of our misery. And he did hear my prayers. Upon learning of our situation, Sir Alexander Ramsay of Dalhousie, who had earned a reputation for being a constant thorn in the English king's side, moved from Edinburgh to the coast with 40 men. Appropriating some fishing boats, Ramsay and his company approached the castle by the sea, and entered the postern next to the sea, despite the efforts of Genos galleys, hired by the English to cut us off the supply. Ramsay and his men brought us a lot of much-needed provision. Do you think, in my joy I forgot my Lord Montagu? By no means. Knowing, he has been kind of dieting lately, I did send him a loaf of freshly baked bread and a bottle of wine. And how surprised his advance guard were, when, charging out of the castle, my Lord Ramsay and his men pushed them all the way back to their camp. As for me and my household, we arranged a great feast. How wonderful it was to refresh our souls after months of rationalizing. After five months of siege and 6,000 English pounds spent on it, English King Edward III was becoming increasingly unhappy about the cost of maintaining this military operation and the absence of any results. 
So he called off his army to fight with the French, which was a priority, and on the 10th of June William Montagu departed, leaving me victorious. I had seen the good lord off, saying my farewells. Adieu Monsieur Montagu. As the last of the English soldiers disappeared into the distance, I couldn't contain my emotions any longer. Tears welled up in my eyes as I clutched the stone railing. The siege was over, and my castle had held strong against the invaders. The feeling of triumph was mixed with a profound sense of gratitude for my loyal defenders, who had stood by my side throughout the harrowing ordeal. And I believed that the memory of this day, as a testament to the resilience and courage of my people, would remain in the annals of history and inspire generations to come.